Welcome, everyone, uh, to our presentation on Ohio's newly enacted transformational mixed-use development tax credit. This is part one of a two-part presentation we'll be providing. Uh, we'll, later on, we'll tell you a little bit more about what will be in part two. Uh, but again, thank you for joining us. Uh, today, I'm joined, I'm Scott Zients. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Sean Byrne, and by John Workman from, OD, from the Ohio Development Services Agency. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Uh, we're gonna move on, uh, just really jump right into it. Uh, and I'm going to uh, first, you know, just give, do some acknowledgments. Uh, first, thank you to our business development team, especially Katie and Hannah, for your work in helping us get this set up. Uh, thanks to Senator Kirk Schuring and his vision uh, behind this credit. Uh, he really uh, carried the ball with this credit program as he's done with the Ohio Historic Tax Credit and so many other important programs, uh, working with some developers throughout the state. Uh, NAOP uh, played a significant role. Uh, I was proud to be part of that organization. Uh, and one of my colleagues report, you know, reminded me that I submitted testimony, which I didn't even remember uh, a couple years ago. Uh, Mike Sikora from NAOP uh, did a lot of work on this, so thanks to Mike. Uh, in terms of uh, how we'll proceed today, we're going to run through the slides. And uh, feel free to ask questions at any point in time. We have a slide near the end with a lot of questions. Uh, that we've begun to ask, we're beginning to hear from others. Uh, and so we'll probably save most questions until that slide, hopefully get to all of them, although we have a lot to cover today. So let's really just jump right into, after we show our faces there, uh, uh, an overview of the program. So this is really an exciting program. This is uh, we see a lot of economic development programs you know, come and go over the years, and some are more effective than others. Uh, this one, uh, I'm, I'm guessing it might have the kind of impact the Ohio Historic Tax Credit Program has, has had if it, if it has that long-lasting sustainability and, it, and it's extended. Uh, what I love about this program uh, is, you know, a lot of economic development programs are like peanut butter, so you spread them, you know, smooth peanut butter, uh, and they can have that kind of an impact, which is, which is solid, but, but not necessarily fantastic. Some are crunchy peanut butter where you have, you know, something special in one area. Is, in one area. Uh, when I think about this, you know, I, I think about, you know, those graters flavors with, 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 with chocolate chips in them. If you know graters, they're not those little chocolate chips. You have this big, you know, humongous chocolate chips every once in a while. That's what this program is about. It's, you're going to have ice cream that's spread throughout the state. But in certain places, you're going to have those, those big projects, those big chips that really make a difference and that really set this program apart from other programs. Uh, so uh, excuse the analogy, but I love graders, uh, and, and, and I think that's going to fit. So in a little overview, uh, up to $100 million in tax credits annually. This is a limited duration program. The sunset is fiscal year 2023. That is the year that ends. Uh, for the state, June 30, 2023. The, there is no carryover. So that, unlike the Ohio Historic Tax Credit Program, where unused amounts can be carried forward to another uh, year, in this program, uh, it's, that $100 million is is for a specific year. It's just the way it was written. Uh, these credits are against the insurance premium tax. Uh, uh, so it's a limited pool of potential tax credit participants but those can be carried forward for up to five years. And of course, as you'll hear later, those credits can be sold to insurance companies. Uh, they don't have to be syndicated like you might syndicate uh, uh, historic tax credit transactions or new markets tax credit transactions. They can be certificated and sold. Uh, we, this, so here's the sort of, again, the greater ice cream aspect of this. 20 million of that 100 million each year is reserved for projects that are more than 10 miles away from a city of 100,000 or more people. So the General Assembly wanted to make sure that everyone got a little bit of this ice cream. Uh, it wasn't just concentrated in the big cities. Uh, so, so, and you'll see there's different standards for those different uh, types of projects, the, the more rural versus the uh, urban. Again, here's the chocolate chip. Uh, the project credit limit is $40 million. That's a lot. You know, obviously, 40 million out of out of, out of 100 million 
that doesn't necessarily mean that's where the state's going to end up whenever it allocates these credits uh, and awards them. But it could give a credit of up to $40 million per project, which obviously can make, a, you know, I guess, a transformational impact. So how much is the credit? Uh, you can see it's 10% of the development cost or the capital contribution, but that's limited by the increase in state and local tax collections from the project site and the surrounding area. This is a really important feature of this program to understand. We're going to devote a little bit of time to this today. Uh, Sean uh, will be covering it, maybe talking to John a little bit about it. But again, this is a really, really important, really uh, a little bit unusual aspect of this of this uh, credit uh, that we expect we're going to be spending a lot of time on over the next few years. And then finally, the tax credit authority is going to make awards uh, you know, through a competitive process that we'll hear more about in a little bit. So moving on, uh, what are the project qualification requirements? This is, you know, I analogize this to, uh, you know, when you're, if you, so we have an, our youngest is a senior in high school applying for scholarships right now. Uh, you know, you have your minimum GPA, your minimum you know, L, uh, yeah, SAT score, ACT score, but again, they're going to be competitive. That's not going to be enough to get, get the scholarships. These are the minimums. These are the minimum GPA and the minimum uh, you know, ACT or SAT score. So what you need is an increase in tax collections uh, during the completion period, and that's from certification by the tax credit authority until the fifth anniversary of the day the project is completed of at least 10% of the estimated development costs. Again, we're going to spend more time on this later, but... The word tax is used in the statute. It's an increase in tax collections. Keep in mind that a lot of projects on which a lot of us work uh, involve TIF service payments or other kind of pilots. Uh, the, the statute doesn't specifically provide for those. Uh, so just something to keep in mind. Uh, and we'll see how that plays out. Uh, second, again, the second minimum GPA part is you have to have more than one use at the project site. Uh, you don't have to have all these, uh, although it might help with the scoring, we'll, we'll find out. But you just need two of these to, to meet the minimum GPA. So if you have structured parking in an office, that's, um, that, 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 again, that meets the minimum GPA requirement. The next item is transformational impact at the site and the surrounding area. This is somewhat subjective the way it's described in the statute. Uh, it would be expect, of course, that ODSA is going to come up with some scoring that might uh, – might illustrate how this works. Uh, now, I, actually, I'll, I'll stop right now. I don't know, John. This is one of the most interesting things about this uh, this this credit when, when we reviewed and started thinking about how this is going to work. Do you have any sense at this point in time how ODSA is going to uh, score uh, and transformational impact at, at the site and the surrounding area? Uh, as my former attorney, before I say anything, just want to share a caveat that uh, anything I say is not binding the agency, obviously, going forward. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, a lot of rules to draft, and a lot of things to consider. So uh, we will take a lot of things into consideration before we come up with the final piece. But, um, you know, I do at least somewhat uh, see this as being very similar to our Historic Preservation Tax Credit Program. Uh, the statute contemplates a scoring procedure if there are multiple projects that are competing for the same uh, funds. If it's competitive, which we do anticipate it's probably going to be. So I definitely anticipate some sort of scoring system being set up. You know, obviously, we love to stay as objective as we possibly can. Historic preservation scoring is almost completely objective. Uh, but there are some subjective measures in the statute that we are required to consider as well. So um, that will be one of the big things that we're working on over the next couple of months here is exactly how we're going to score this based on what the statute tells us we have to look at and then based on uh, other items that we determine are important in making sound recommendations to the tax credit authority. All right. That was a th – th thank you, John. Uh, helpful, yet uh, you, you didn't walk yourself in no corner, so you, you, uh, nice, nice in this work. Uh, so so uh, the uh, – Moving on, some of these, uh, again, minimum GPA type requirements. Uh, one is that the project would not be complete if, if not for receiving the credit. Uh, so a couple of things here. Obviously, this is a but-for requirement. Uh, this does not say the project cannot, cannot have started. Uh, so one of the questions we may address later is, well, what if a project has started? Is that going to 
is that going to be a negative? Uh, how do you, how do you factor uh, w- w- whether a project is started or not? The key is that it cannot be completed but for receiving the credit. And then finally, uh, again, a very important one is that construction must begin within 12 months of your award or certification. Uh, so, uh, again, the state wants to transform now, not, not sometime way off into the future. I'm going to move on here. So, again, this is my la- you know, our last you know, slide on sort of minimum GPA type stuff. This mostly speaks for itself. Uh, we'll point out a couple things. One, you can note the significant di- dichotomy between uh, projects that are located within 10 miles of a city with a population of 100,000 plus uh, or projects located more than 10 miles from a city. Uh, and again, especially looking at the more rural type or small city type projects, no minimum investment required versus 50 million. Uh, again, for the smaller communities, it just needs to be two stories or 75,000 square feet, pretty low requirement. Uh, so, or you can, there's these uh, ways you can have two or more buildings uh, that together meet the requirements. One one thing that we've already had a question about and, and, and we expect will be a, a question others have is this connectedness. So, you know, we want to have, well, just put aside the policy, uh, you can see you can have two or more buildings uh, looking at the city side that are connected to, to one another uh, or on the same or contiguous parcels and collectively have 350,000 square feet. Uh, so what does it mean to be connected? Uh, is a, is a walkway that's connected, uh, with, uh, uh, you know, with covering from the elements, uh, appropriate, uh, is what, 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 what's required to be connected. We have all sorts of interesting questions as we proceed here, but again, these are these minimum GPA requirements basically speak for themselves, uh, uh, but that's just going to get you so your application is not rejected. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over now to Sean, uh, who's going to walk us through uh, with John the application process, potential timeline, and some other slides. Yeah, so thanks, Scott. And, and let me start with uh, with a little bit of a disclaimer on this. Um, this is be. I put this together. Um, I put this together. And and made and talked to John briefly about this and said, look, I recognize that no one can commit to these. They're statutory commitments. This timeline is what it would we what would it would take to essentially be able to do an award this fiscal year. And this is not something that development has committed to. But this is to give you an idea. Under the statute, the governor signs. Um, um, uh, amended substitute Senate Bill 39 on December 29th. Um, that gives that started a clock of 120 days for for development to adopt rules. Now the rules process has its own set. You know, putting aside doing emergency rules, um, and the rules process has its own set of procedures. Included in that would be that um, rules from the ag- agency rules have to be submitted to LSC and the Secretary of State 65 days or more before they can be adopted. So that would put the rules being due as early as uh, February 21st um, in order to have the rules adopted April 28th, which would be 120 days. Now for that, there would also be a public hearing, um, uh, essentially 31 to 40 days before adoption. And then um, following that 120 day period, assuming that the rules are adopted in 120 days, the, the statute provides that the tax credit authority shall accept applications no later than 30 days following adoption of the rules. And so this becomes a lot of work for everybody. Um, and, and obviously we're gonna wanna keep a close eye on the rules as they get adopted to make sure because a 30 day application period is, is relatively narrow. Um, following that 30 day application period, the statute provides 45 days uh, before, uh, for uh, you know, that TCA must start beginning approving applications 
no later than 45 days after the applications are first accepted. That puts us into fiscal year, um, into our next fiscal year, fiscal year 2022. Um, and so that would have to be done on a shortened schedule than what's required in the statute. But we wanted to kind of lay that out for everyone because a lot of people are asking, you know, we've gotten a lot of questions you know, so how soon are these awards going to be available? When can we start moving forward? There are several steps in the process. And, and with that overview, I just wanted to toss it over to John to give his impressions of, of uh, what, what, current, uh, what development's current thinking is on, 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 that, on the schedule. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Uh, you know, we appreciate you kind of putting this timeline together for us and giving us an idea of how we could get it done this fiscal year. I think that's what we want to do. Uh, we want to try and, and utilize this program to its full extent. We want to try and get these dollars out on the street as quickly as possible so that we can get these projects moving as quickly as possible. So um, it is in a very aggressive timeline. Um, there's a lot that needs to be done uh, and, and most of the work is on the front end with respect to the rules. So uh, we're working as quickly as possible. We are working now. Uh, we're meeting regularly with the team that's working on this program to try and get those rules together. Um, we've had a number of meetings with interested parties regarding this program, and really it's just an opportunity for us to take that input. What are the issues that folks think are important? Uh, what are the issues that they think need to be addressed in the rules? That sort of thing. So um, we are, are going to work to do our best to, to get these credits out this fiscal year as much as we possibly can. Um, but again, the timeline is pretty aggressive. Um, we had wished that we had a couple more months uh, from the passage of the bill to be able to get this up and running. Um, but. You know, we're, we're given this situation and we're going to do our best to execute as quickly as we can. Um, thanks, John. And, and you know, interesting, we just, just got a question on if, if it is available this year, would the entire uh, uh, amount, of the, the entire $100 million potentially be available this year? I think that would be the anticipation, yeah. Again, you know, like you guys said earlier, $100 million per fiscal year. So once we cross that fiscal year barrier, uh, based on the current language of the statutes, uh, those those tax credits are no longer available. So I think that would be the anticipation. Assuming we can get uh, something done before the end of this fiscal year, get to the tax credit authority in June, um, you know, barring any any changes to the statute that might occur, our anticipation would be to try and, and fully allocate the fiscal year twenty one dollars. Thanks. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, uh, when when looking at um, the award and certification process. So TCA considers a potential impact. The tax credit authority is going to look at the impact, and statutorily, they have to look at the impact on the project site, the surrounding area, and they have to look at it in terms of architecture, accessibility to pedestrians, retail, entertainment, and dining sales, job creation, property values, connectivity, and revenue, uh, and, and, and then revenue from sales, income, lodging, and property tax. So I, I, I'm going to... I think I want to break that down a little bit and talk through the different parts of this, because this program's different and, and it's very exciting. You know, Senator Shearing has, has put in place, uh, you know, uh, a different uh, different metrics than than what have been used in in many other programs, uh, uh, in in the language and then the legislature with various uh, amendments as they've gone have really. Uh, uh, identified some, some key impacts that they're looking at. I guess I would start with the tax credit authority is going to have to look at the potential impact in, on, of the project on the site and the surrounding area. Um, I wanted to flag right now, we're not sure, and this is a question that comes up later, but I think seeing it here, I want to just flag it. We're not sure what the surrounding area is yet. Um, John, I don't know if you guys have had any talk about that yet or if you've got any sense of that or that's still something that's uh, a ways from being figured out. Yeah, I don't think we've come to a final decision on that. Um, you know, we do have, you know, at least something that is analogous that we used to administer, which is the catalytic program of the historic preservation tax credit, um, where we were basically tasked to do exactly that, uh, to look at a radius. Uh, and I believe if I remember correctly, uh, we established a 2,500 foot radius. Uh, so it's kind of that half mile walkable distance, that sort of thing. Um, so I think, you know, that's probably where we will start from consideration and then obviously uh, determine whether or not that's appropriate, whether or not, whether or not that needs to be expanded, contracted, whatever it might be. But we do at least have some lessons uh, from a program that we've run in the past that is at least somewhat similar to this program. Oh, that's helpful. Um, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of looking at the impacts, uh, 
I, I just wanted to flag, you know, note that architecture, accessibility of pedestrians, retail, entertainment, and dining sales, job creation, property values, connectivity. Um, I guess I I, I, I want to uh, understand. I, I, do do you understand connectivity to be um, connectivity to the community or or connectivity from a broadband standpoint or something else? I think in my first read of it, when I read connectivity, I assumed broadband. Obviously, that's a big push that the state overall is is making uh, to make sure that we have, you know, uh, the high speed. And I'm not a technical person. The high speed internet necessary in these areas uh, to be able to advance these developments. So I think that's probably our, at least what we believe connectivity is referring to is that broadband access. Great. Um... And then I, I think um, we talked a little bit, and Scott mentioned a little bit about revenue from you know sales, income, lodging, and property taxes. Uh, with respect to those, um, I, I think we noted that service payments were not included. Is that is something you guys have had a chance to talk about? Um, uh, you know, uh, TIF service payments or other service uh, payments in lieu of taxes. We haven't had a lot of discussion on it, but you know we do have to take the language as it's presented. Uh, as Scott talked about earlier, it does talk about taxes. So um, that might be something we have to look at a little bit more in the rules and, and put a little bit more definition around that. Um, but typically, when you think of taxes, you think of something that um, is paid for the benefit of, of a, government, a government entity, something like that. So I think that's probably at least where we would start, and then we would go from there and see whether or not that needs to be expanded. Great. And I'm just trying, if I may, on that point, I, I, I wonder, and we don't want to go down a rabbit hole on, on that, but because it will be such a significant issue, uh, I wonder whether the department might look differently at, at, at TIF service payments that come directly to the developer uh, versus TIF service payments that are uh, that are really community-driven and used for public infrastructure improvements, because as, as development knows, uh, you know, t people's property can be put in a TIF without their consent. Uh, and, 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 and most TIFs use, use the TIF revenues for public infrastructure improvements. So, so something to think about, uh, it, it, there might, might be a nuanced answer uh, as I think about it. But again, I'm not writing the rules. Uh, so, so John, you have that fun part. Thanks, Scott. I'll I'll let uh, I'll let John think about that one a little bit. Um, so, as you're looking at the certification process, the tax credit authority, um, and again, this is slightly different. This is different than anything else tax credit authority has done, isn't it, John? Yeah, completely different. Uh, so it, it's going to be a, a new paradigm for the tax credit authority, a new thing for them to look at. Um, you know, really, our role is to make sound recommendations to the authority and, and get them through the process and make sure that. Um, they're doing the right thing. So that's what we're going to work to do. That's great. So uh, the tax credit authority has to confirm that the project qualifies under the statute and the rules. Um, and this is where, um, you know, we've got the, we, we talked a little bit about this, um, but this is where it starts to get interesting and, you know, from a new perspective and, and a little bit different than most other programs. The estimated increase in tax collections during the completion period exceeds 10% of the estimated development costs for the project. Um, I guess the way I, I've articulated that to, to people is that um, if you're, you know, um, if you're doing, if you're getting a credit, you've got to show that more than the credit amount is going to be, be generated from the project in terms of an increase in tax collection. Um, and, and that can be a, a high burden to hit, depending on the type of project. Um, the, the the other requirement that TCA must confirm is that the project will not be completed unless the applicant receives the credit. Um, I, I'm I'm curious. I, I know uh, Scott, you you talked a little bit about the difference between that and you know um, and and you know the project would not would not essentially commence without the credit. Um, this is a different standard. The project will not be completed unless the applicant receives a credit. I know our understanding, our expectation is that projects that are already underway would qualify. Um, John, have you thought about uh, what kind of things you they, the projects might have to might want to be able what might want to be able to show to demonstrate that um, that they need this this support in order to complete the project? 
Yeah, we've started to think about that, and I know I keep going back to historic, but for us, it's it's kind of the guide that we're using because it's the closest thing that we have. So there's really two ways under historic to prove that the tax credit is a major factor in your decision to either move forward with the project or increase your investment in the project. And one is you haven't started the project yet. So I think in that case, that's a pretty simple analysis. If the project hasn't started yet, and you can make the case that without this transformational mixed-use development tax credit, the project will not move forward. Then I think you can probably satisfy the but-for analysis. And on the historic side, it's it's kind of a narrative statement that we request as part of the application. Explain to us why this is necessary for you to be able to move forward with your project. There's also another way to qualify uh, under the but-for analysis for the historic preservation tax credit program. And that is basically to prove that you have not incurred more than 25% of the costs of the project and that you will not be able to continue your investment in the project and complete the project unless you receive historic preservation tax credits. So you know, we already have in other programs, you know, kind of set a level as to, to where you would be at. Um, again, that might not be the right number for this program. That might not be the right analysis for this program. We're still looking into that. Um, but I can say very clearly that this is meant to be an incentive program. It is meant to incentivize activity. So we need to ensure that it is incentivizing activity that is not basically reimbursing developers for something that has already occurred in the past. So, you know, we're going to keep a critical eye on that. We want to make sure that, you know, this is the final piece. This is what actually makes these projects happen. So uh, we'll work through that in the rules. There will definitely be some more information in the rules regarding uh, kind of the but-for analysis and how we determine whether or not the tax credit is a major factor to move forward. Thanks, John. Um, the, the last bullet point on this slide is that the tax credit authority may conduct interviews of applicants. Um, I, I know that that's something that, you know, um, a, a, a tax credit authority has always been able to, to, to talk to um, the presenters or, you know, the, the, the parties uh, who, who appear um, in support of, of the different projects. Uh, but conducting interviews of applicants sounds a little bit different. Um, uh, how, how do you foresee that? Um, how would you foresee that rolling out, John? And do you see? Do you expect? Um, do you expect that to be um, a, re a requirement or more of a use for clarifications? Yeah, I think we're going to want to talk to the authority members about that. You know, obviously they're aware of the passage of SB 39 and that they play a role in administration of the program. That's very clear. Um, I assume that, um, you know, one or two of the members might want to go ahead with that interview process. Um, and it might be a little bit different, say, this fiscal year than it might be in future fiscal years, again, just because of the timeline that we're on. Um, in this fiscal year, again, if we hope to get the tax credits out the door, then we're probably looking at the June TCA meeting. So, you know, would potentially the interviews be concurrent uh, with the authority's review and approval of the projects, potentially. Um, would the authority members want to talk to these folks and ask them questions about their project and get more comfortable with that before approving a recommendation? Probably. So we'll talk to the authority members about that, see what their uh, intent is there, uh, and decide whether or not uh, that's something that we want to do. Um, but, you know, like you said, it's not anything really different from what they can do now. Uh, tax credit authority meetings, uh, currently, obviously, the big focus of those is job creation tax credit projects, new projects. Um, typically, at this point, we have the project managers uh, from either Jobs Ohio or the regional partners, and those are the ones who present the projects to the authority. Um, but that hasn't always been the case. In the past, we did have the companies attend uh, and basically address the authority about their project and provide information about how the tax credit was a major factor in them moving forward. So. Um, we'll look at that model, what we used to do. We'll look at the current model, and we'll talk to the authority members and see what their preference is. Great. Um, so moving on to sort of the post-award certification process, and this is where um, this is where the math starts to come in. Um, uh, so the standard computation of, of a credit, uh, that's, um, and, and the language of the statute, I, I think we've all found um, a little bit, we have to kind of work through the numbers a little bit and think about, and, and, and the first bullet point here, I think um, it's, it says the lesser of the following, uh, minus any credits sold to an insurance company. In other words, um, a project gets a certain amount of credits for that project. Um, uh, it's not, you can't add to that with other, you know, you can't have an insurance company apply for part of it and you apply for part of it or two developers apply. Um, uh, it's all part of one pro, it's all part of the project. Um, you know, they would minus any credit. And, and obviously if a credit sold, it would already be um, included. Uh, but what the real focus on, on computing the award is 
um, it's up to t it's really up to you know not to exceed 10 percent of your development costs so if your original uh, application had development costs of 100 million dollars and the award is it, it, the, the award would then be 10 million dollars tax credits but if it turned out your actual development costs were 90 million that would reduce the maximum amount of your award to nine million dollars from there you look at how much you get and and when so five percent of the adjusted development costs plus so that would be if it was reduced from 100 million to 90 as your adjusted development cost it would be a nine million dollar award four and a half million uh would be based on it would be um it would be awarded um sorry <laughs> Five percent of the development costs um, would be based that you'd be awarded when you know essentially up, up front when it's completed, and you would have to show an increase in tax collections over the next five years in order to receive the other five percent. So, in other words, you're you're not getting ten percent tax credits at completion. You're getting five percent of the credits, and then you have to show that the increase in tax collections is at least 6%, 7%, 8%, 9%, 10% over the next five years. So as tax collections come in, you get additional awards, um, uh, uh, you know, certificates awarded. John, is that, um, is that how you, you understand the process as well? So I'm gonna plead a little bit of ignorance on this for the time being. Um, that is the part of the statute that I have not yet had the opportunity to really delve into and try to fully understand. So um, I don't really want to opine one way or the other. Um, but I do trust that uh, you guys have taken a really close look at this and, and what you are saying is probably uh, a fair representation of what the statute indicates. Yeah. So uh, to kind of summarize, for the standard, the standard computation of the award, what's important to know is that you're gaining five percent, and then the other five percent is contingent upon showing the increase in taxes over a period of time. You get up to five years to show that. If you never increase the tax collection by that ten percent, then you don't get it. It can never go above that ten percent number, and that's the cap on it. Now, there's an alternative, though. Um, there's an alternative. Um, uh, computation that you can request. And, and so this is a time after a project is certified, but before it's complete. So this is, you get your award in hopefully June, um, and you, know, you start, you, 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 request, um, you request permission from TCA and you request them to select um, a, a professional who a third party who you're going to engage in, you the developer will engage and pay for to confirm that they are reasonably certain that the increase in tax collections will exceed 10% of the development costs in the development plan for the project within one year after completion. So there are certain types of projects that might be able to do this. If you can show that and you can demonstrate that, then the recipient's going to receive the full 10% credit immediately upon completion of the project. Again, you don't get it at the time you show it, you get it at the time you complete the project. But no portion is, there, the, the credits, there's no portion of the credits that are dependent on the increase in taxes if you've proven that taxes within one year will be at least the amount of the credit. So that is something that you know some some projects might be very interested in. Um, it really, I think, is going to depend on the nature of the project. On a hundred million dollar project with a ten million dollar credit, are you going to be able to show that within twelve months of project completion, you would be able? To, the, it's reasonably certain that co tax collections will increase by at least that ten million dollars. Um, I'm going to start with John. John, have you, have you had any other programs where um, where either development or one of the commissions engages third parties to um, you want know, to talk through any programs where they engage third parties to make make recommendations um, or or other sort of determinations? Not that I can recall now. Yeah, and um, yeah, it's it's really very different for um, from a from a tax credit standpoint. I'm not sure. Um, 
uh, Scott, I don't know if you've thought through, uh, you know, uh, how how that'll work, um, how that might work, uh, but that's certainly something to be thinking about too. Right, I, I'm uh, sure it'll be easy for John to figure out. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks, Scott. Yep. So, um, so with that, um, with that, I think um, a, a couple things. One is. Um, uh, we, that leaves us with a number of sort of key open questions. You know, we've got these two methods of calculating the awards, depends on the project, and frankly, as a, in reality, it's going to substantially depend on the type of project you have as far as how quickly the taxes are going to be generated. Um, we've identified a, a number of key open questions. I think the first one we've already, we've already talked about um, a little bit. Will there be detailed scoring matrix like historic preservation? It sounds, John, like you would love to the extent possible to be able to, to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and another reason for that, you know, as you know, is we're going to have to defend these decisions, um, both to the other applicants who aren't awarded and to the public, because these are state tax dollars, these are taxpayer money that are being spent for these projects. So, you know, to, the best way to be able to defend a decision is to show, here's, you know, show your work. How did you get there? Um, and I think, you know, a detailed and, and well-developed scoring matrix gets us there. Um, you know, like on historic preservation tax credits, we can very easily at the end of each round show exactly why we got where we got and who was recommended for funding and who wasn't. And I think the anticipation is that we would try and do something very similar for this program. Yeah. Um, we, we've kind of all made the assumption that these are going to be competitive um, because I know, I know, We've had a number of questions about it, and I know there were a number of parties that testified. Um, hey, John, I, you expect these to be very competitive awards, don't you? Oh, absolutely, yeah. We've we've already had a number of calls uh, with interested parties, folks that have projects um, that they've been working on for a long time, that we're kind of waiting on this last piece, or that are just now coming up that are a good fit for the program. So absolutely expect this program to be competitive. John, I uh, jump in on one of these that's really interesting me uh, about the role of insurance companies. Obviously, it's just going to insurance companies, uh, but you know they, they don't. Uh, questions whether it's going to be a buyer's market or a seller's market, and, and, and what the price is going to be when these things are sold. Uh, do, do you, what, what kind of activity are you seeing from insurance companies? Have they been interacting with you and, and asking you a lot of questions, or is it more on the developer side? Yeah, and now that you bring that up, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that previously. I, I, as far as I can recall, I've been involved in most of the conversations we've had with folks, and they have all been with developers. Um, so far, I have not uh, had any interactions directly with insurance companies insurance companies regarding this program. Um, so we're thinking sellers. Uh, we're thinking very similar to uh, how some of the other programs syndicate their tax credits uh, and get the value for those tax credits up front. Um, and that leads to us also knowing that, that folks are going to need at least some certainty around these awards. Now, there's a lot of things that, that, that need to happen for everything to be certified and, and verified that the uh, transformational mixed use development actually occurred as we anticipated it. Um, that also might you know, lead to decisions on the developer side about you know, which method of acceptor or, or claiming the tax credit they might choose based on you know, whether or not they are bringing in an institutional investor and they have to give that investor you know, as much of a guarantee as they possibly can right under any of these projects that will be completed. Yep. And, I, and I'll note for the, for the attendees, we, uh, we reached out to some of the largest insurance companies in the state uh, who, who, who play in other tax credits, and they were noncommittal. Uh, my instincts tell me they're going to uh, participate, but I think they're in the same position everyone else is right now with this having passed just a few weeks ago, trying to figure it out. And, and none of them were uh, willing to yet, you know, step up and, 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 and speculate with us. So, so thanks, John, for joining us and, uh, and, and, and doing that a little bit with us. Absolutely. Uh, so, so, sorry, Sean, for jumping in on that one. That, no, no, that, that, that's, that, that's the one we, we keep getting asked. <laughs> yeah, no, and I, I think I, I'm curious just to think, you know, in terms of we talked about sort of the surrounding area, we talked about a little bit about, you know, ongoing projects versus new projects a little bit. Um, in thinking about tax increases, 
it sounds like it might be, you know, relocations might be okay as far as jobs. It, you know, it depends, I guess that's something to think about from in the surrounding area. And I don't know if that's a little different than, than sort of catalytic, um, but you know, it, it, it relocating jobs could be from the same jurisdiction. Um, and whether that would qualify or would it have to be, you know, for an increase in taxes, would it have to be relocating jobs from another jurisdiction? I don't know. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's obviously, uh, you know, a lot of that is going to be based on how we define the surrounding area. Um, I think, you know, depending on how we define that, if you're looking at inside of the area and you're talking about, you know, uh, tax revenue moving from one place to another inside the area, then, I, you know, it's very difficult to call that increase unless they're also looking at an expansion, right? Um, so just kind of depending on how that area is defined, um, whether it's you know a certain radius, whether it's a number of blocks, whether it's an entire municipality, uh, will kind of dictate you know what the definition of increase in tax revenues is as well. Because like you said, Sean, you don't really want to count relocations inside of the the surrounding area as increase or new because it's not. Yeah. So. Um... Uh, the other thing that struck me is, um, will more mixed use be better? Uh, that, that was a question that, that sort of underlined uh, a few questions I've had uh, about this. Um, you know, is is you know, is it better for it to be a really big office with residential, or does it help to then throw in retail and a hotel and three other things too? Yeah, and that's something that we will have to consider as part of the scoring, um, you know, because a lot of the things that we are charged with looking at, um, you know, walkability, accessibility, connectivity, all that kind of stuff, um, you know, really you would anticipate the more uses, the better. I can't say that for certain right now, but, you know, if, if you look at, like Scott talked about earlier, an office building with a parking garage that's basically serving itself versus a larger development that includes office, residential, uh, retail, uh, potentially hotel, parking garage, you see there that obviously the, the transformational aspect of the project is is exponentially greater than it is if you're talking about something that is, is much smaller and only utilizes a couple of those pieces. So, you know, that's unfortunately or fortunately, uh, that's probably something we're going to have to look at a little bit subjectively um, and kind of, you know, look at the different projects, compare them against each other and determine you know, based on what they are proposing to do, based on where they're at, based on the surrounding amenities, what is going to have the most transformational uh, kind of impact on the area. Yeah. So, so we're beginning to get, we've actually received 17 questions uh, from attendees. We're not gonna be able to get to all of them, but wanna begin to address some of them. Uh, some are really for John and some might be for us. One, uh, John, uh, do you, Obviously, the state historic tax credit program has a semi-annual process, uh, which which is really effective. Uh, so it's not delaying projects. Uh, do you have a sense yet for whether, when uh, obviously this first round is not going to be semi-annual, but right. whether mm -hmm. the next couple of years might be semi-annual or, or or even some type of rolling or quarterly basis for review? Yeah, that's something we're going to have to talk. We're going to have to figure out in the rules because it does lay out. You know, we need to set up the application process, timing, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I, I anticipate that we are going to get pushed to get the credits out as quickly as possible to make awards as quickly as possible. So, you know, that likely means that folks are going to push us to try and, and issue awards as soon as possible when we get to fiscal 22 and obviously fiscal 23 as well. Uh, so does that mean that we front load things? Uh, does that mean that we potentially do two rounds? I think those are some questions that still need to be answered uh, in conjunction with our leadership team. Okay. So, Sean, did um, you have one? Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to uh, I wanted to tackle one that I got asked a couple times, and um, I've been asked a couple times. We were asked, um, you know, under the statute, credits are available for fiscal years 2021, 22, and 23. Since 20 passed, is it possible to allocate that to add that to 21? I think you know, you know we already you know I think we already weighed in a little bit on that. Um, John, do we? You want to just be clear on that? Our, our, I think our reading on the statute's the same. Um, that there's no carryover. Yeah, and I was looking for the specific language, but I'm pretty sure it says awarded in fiscal year. Um, obviously, we can't award anything in fiscal year 2020 at this point. We're well beyond that. So um, I think we, we interpret that very similar to the way that you do. Yeah. yeah. I think that was a function of, obviously, that this was introduced uh, 
in early 2019 uh, right. and just never got changed. Scott, do you want to, should we uh, just sort of... Um, yeah, yeah uh, let's start to answer some since, of these. Yes, yeah, so I saw one from from an old friend. I won't call out his name. Uh, the, the, uh, the the miles from a city, uh, he used a geographic term I didn't know. I'll have to look it up. Uh, he asked he's 10 miles from a cent road or the polygon boundaries. Uh, <laughs> so, I thought, uh, so I'll have to look again. Thanks for the good word usage. Uh, so the uh, it is, I think, polygon boundaries. If I understand, it's basically the widest boundary. So so because uh, it doesn't say otherwise. Uh, so it just says within ten miles of a major city. So for example, in Columbus, I haven't gotten on my roller or a map to figure out how far Delaware is, for example, away from Columbus. Yeah, you know, we all know Columbus is so ginormous geographically. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna eat up a lot of communities that are relatively small just because of how far it reaches. And I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm guessing Sean and John interpret that the same way I do. Yeah, I think that's probably correct. I think, you know, we have to establish a way that's easy to administer for both uh, the applicants and for ourselves and something that be, can be utilized consistently. Um, you know, like you said, Scott, uh, hearing the, the term centro, that's the first time I've heard it as well. Um, I don't know if potentially that's a, a standard definition or if potentially, you know, certain cities might look at that in different ways. So, you know, in my mind, and again, this is just my opinion, the easiest way to do it is, you know, where the, wherever the project is, kind of put your pencil on the map right there and somehow make yourself a little 10 mile radius circle and see whether or not it touches any of those uh, larger cities as defined by the code. Um, and that's probably in my mind, the easiest way to do it. Uh. Sean, do you want to take one? Oh, let's see. Um, I actually hadn't, I was just checking something. Um, um, oh yeah, so how how will the use of other, there, we've had this question a few different ways. Um, how is this gonna interact with other state credits or the use of other credits count for or against this, these projects? Yeah, and I, I saw this question as well, and I think it's a very good question. Uh, I think it's been asked a couple of times now. <laughs> Again, going back to historic preservation, and I hate to keep going back to it, but you know, really we're just looking to see that the financing stack is in place. Again, these projects must be under construction within 12 months, and, and we're going to enforce that language from the statute because you know must is a very specific term. So you know, we want to make sure that projects that are being awarded under this program have their financing stack in place and are basically as shovel ready as they possibly can be. Under the Historic Preservation Tax Credit Program, we don't penalize folks for you know some of their sources of funding coming from uh, other sources from the state government, federal government, local government, uh, or even Jobs Ohio or you know some of the other economic development entities across the state. So um, you know, we'll we'll consider that. Um, but again, really. We need to see that you have the capital stack. We need to see that you're able to move forward with the project because the last thing that we want to do is to award a project that then is not able to get under construction within 12 months. Um, and I'll probably have to put on my hard hat and go out and, and look at these projects, assuming that I'm actually able to do that by the time this stuff uh, gets up and running. Um, but you know, we're, we're going to have to be pretty strict about that and ensure that the projects that we are awarding are actually getting underway as required by the statute. Great. Uh Thanks, John. I, I'll take one that we've been asked a couple different ways about the definition of development costs. Uh, you know, one person asks if it's going to essentially be like the historic tax credit, you know, uh, you know, QRE definition, or and another person asks whether it's going to include soft costs. So I'll note what the statutory definition is and, and let John elaborate if he has anything on, on the rules. So the statutory definition is, is expenditures paid or incurred by the property owner in completing a certified project, including a &E, or architectural and engineering fees, uh, uh, and including expenses incurred before the date the project is certified. So that's something notable. Again, it can ex include expenses incurred before it's certified. Uh, it, it, th th that's basically the definition. Uh, it... it, it John, do you, do you anticipate addressing that in more detail in the administrative code rules, or is that not yet clear? Yeah, I think we're going to have to talk to our legal team a little bit about this and, and make sure that we all agree. 
it's one of those things where you have a statute that kind of lists specific things but doesn't list other things. So is it exclusive to the items that are listed? Does it leave room for us to be able to add additional things to that? Because obviously, you know, there's there's a ton of soft costs beyond architectural and engineering fees, legal fees, accounting fees, all kinds of different things that go into these projects. And we recognize that, you know, working through new markets and historic. So um, we'll have to kind of, you know, get our heads together with our legal team and see whether or not that gives us room to add additional items that are not specifically enumerated in the revised code. Okay. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, did you want to take one, Sean, or you want me to? I'm going to let you. I'm still reading through. <laughs> okay. So, so, so a couple of different people basically asked what qualifies as an insurance company. Uh, and in brief, uh, the, the statutory definition is simple. If there's any uh, gray, it's, it's in the tax section. So if, it's, if you're an insurance company for purposes of the insurance taxes in Chapter 5725 or 5729, uh, so it looks to revise code section 5725. 5725.18 or 5729.03. Uh, we are not experts on those insurance you know, premium tax uh, sections, but uh, insurance companies know whether they're you know, companies know whether they're, they're subject to that. In brief, yeah. And, and Scott, you raise a great point, though. Um, you know, insurance premium tax for any given insurance company um, is. Is some it's a relatively small percentage. It's a relatively small amount of money um, per insurance company, and it's in the millions of dollars potentially. But it's this is a li this is a limited pool of of, um, of potential purchasers for these credits or users of these credits. And while a hundred million dollars each year um, is a lot less than what the taxes are, it's it's not a hundred million compared to to uh, personal income tax or or or, um, or other some other tax programs and they're not refundable so they you know they they have to have tax to use against them um, so that's just something that we'll have to see how that plays out yeah that, that's uh, and I, I've not talked uh, uh, to Senator Schering about that uh, I'm, I'm not sure why it was limited that way uh, but we all know you know that the, the the cat is, is sort of the sacred uh, thing that the General Assembly doesn't like to touch. Uh, yeah. Which I've always kind of found, found kind of odd because it, it's a general revenue tax, just like others. Uh, and on the historic cat, going to be using that analogy, uh, you know, it's been through uncodified law from time to time. You can take it against the cat. Uh, so uh, hopefully, from my perspective, hopefully this will be expanded so we have a larger market of purchasers. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and well, I think you're probably right. I, it's probably going to be a limited pool. And um, this discussion uh, kind of sparked my, my mind about something that we talked about earlier about, you know, who who's going to be the leads on these, right? I would guess that insurance companies wouldn't want to be the ones filing the applications for these program, this program. So I would assume it would probably be the developers that would be the lead on filing the application. Um, so I think it's probably, you know, I, my opinion, my thought is that it's going to skew more towards developers being the ones applying, developers being the ones getting awarded the credits, and then that secondary market being set up on the back end. Yeah, and along those lines, I mean, we 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 got asked, uh, we've been asked a few questions. You know, do you have to have insurance company lined up? No, it's just a question of you know, you've got to try to figure out what your best situation is to maximize your value if you're the project applicant as to when to involve the insurance company or when to try to um, market your your the award. Um, uh, but you don't have to have someone on the front end. You do not need an insurance company as a partner on, on the project. So another interesting question that came in. Uh, so I think we know the, tech, the statutory answer, but, but interested more in John's answer about how things may play out. That's what, if any, is the role of local government in the application and award process? Uh, John, do you have any preliminary thoughts on that? Yeah, so on the historic preservation side, you know, we ask that projects uh, provide proof of local support. 
Um, I think we're probably going to want something similar to that for this program. I, I would anticipate that we wouldn't want to provide state tax dollars and incentivize projects that the locals aren't in favor of. Uh, I don't think we would want to get cross with our, our local government partners on that. Um, so I think that's probably something that will be included. Um, and then there is, um, and I'm getting all the provisions mixed up in my head, you know, with respect to calculation of tax revenue, increase in tax revenue, I know that there's a role for the locals to play there to assist the tax credit authority in making that calculation. Um, so I think those are probably the two main areas um, that we would uh, look for local community government participation in with respect to this program. Okay. Uh, Scott, with sort of the back and with, with sort of our conversation, I wanted to make sure we didn't miss. There was a a, a pretty um, a, I guess I would call it a clarification slash technical question. Um, the statute uses the word you know certified all over the place um and and really what is it, 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 i read certified to, to sort of be awarded uh, and that's different than like the actual issuance of a certificate is um and i would just ask you know uh, john i'm not sure if you've looked at that uh, enough but my understanding is that you know your project gets certified but the certificate the certificate isn't immediately issued with that is that your understanding Yes, I would agree with that. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. I think they do somewhat interchangeably, uh, probably not intentionally use the words awarded and certified. Yeah. Yeah, again, we're, a lot of the questions we're getting from the uh, attendees are similar to what we've been hearing from others. Uh, you know, so questions about level of pricing, uh, the, we haven't heard Anything yet from insurance companies on that? That they're uh, again really, again just got enacted a little over a month ago. So, uh, so they're they're figuring that out. It, it, it's hard to say. It feels like it might be a little bit of a buyer's market, but once you get the so the, the certificate can be sold at any time, and that that's the neat thing about this being certificated credit rather than like a store like federal historics, which are syndicated. That when you bring the investor in on the front end, and they're and they're, they're accounting for you know all, all sorts of you know, completion risk, et cetera. You can sell this credit after you complete the project, uh, and so therefore you take away that risk, and it might be more of a seller's market when you do it that way. Uh, on the front end, you know, Sean and I were talking about this before the call. Uh, we, we can see insurance companies uh, and developers making deals to, to provide some upfront capital. Uh, but but it's really going to be, I think, a case by case basis how it plays out. I don't know, Sean, if you have any additional thoughts there. No, I think I think that's one of those we'll have to wait and see. And for each party, it's going to really depend on their own situation. I think the only thing that I'm, I'm, I wanted to highlight is because if you're not qualifying under the special, you know, under the one year, you know, uh, taxes increase within one year, um, you know, alternative method. Because the actual certificates are going to be issued over a time, there is a time value of money that everybody's going to have to account for. Um, so just something to think about. Um, but um, that's really um, that's really pretty much all all I had on that. Um, I wanted to uh, say, you know, I think we can. I think we're pretty much at, at the end here. Are there any other things we need to cover, uh, Scott? I, I don't think there. Uh... We'll try to respond to questions we didn't get to uh, after uh, after our presentation. Again, we, we appreciate everyone. And if for some reason uh, we don't respond, feel free to email us. Uh, we're using a new video platform uh, and and uh, not still not 100% confident in my ability to handle it correctly. So if you don't hear from me, I didn't diss you. Uh, please email me and just assume it was a technical problem. Uh, yeah, and with that, I just want to highlight... Um, and offer part two to this after the release of the administrative rules. Um, and we don't know, we're not sure exactly when that'll be, but we plan to, after the release of the administrative rules, schedule another, um, uh, another discussion like this to really focus in on the application process, the information needed, and strategies to highlight project strengths um, and, 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 and provide additional answers or more questions as we, as we look at the rules. So expect us coming back to you in, um, 
somewhere probably in the you know 45 day range, something like that, um, uh, and and keep an eye out for it on your email. But thank you very much uh, for attending, and and John, thank you for participating. Of course, of course. Thanks all. See you next time.